as is always the way with these things, often uh, people tend to join a couple of minutes late. So um, we will just wait a minute or two before kicking off formally. Okay, then I'm going to kick off. Um, if anyone else comes in, they will have the ability to watch this back by the magic of technology as we are recording at least the beginning and the presentations. So um, I'll start off by just saying welcome to everyone. A very quick, quick introduction from my side. Um, I'm Joe Moran, one of the political advisors here at Eurogroup for Animals. I'm fortunate enough to see um, names and, and some faces that I, that I recognize. Uh, however, welcome to you all and one of you, um, wherever you're joining from. We hope that this event will provide food for thought as we move forward um, and as we look forward indeed to the anticipated revision of the uh, EU regulation on live transport. Just over 40 years ago, Eurogroup for Animals was founded with a view to tackling this very question. How ultimately do we better regulate, reduce, and eventually move away from the transportation of animals for further fattening and for slaughter? Sadly, in 2021, we find ourselves seeing images all too regularly of animals that are being transported in often the most horrific conditions imaginable. Images that we all find, I'm sure, distressing, upsetting, and that, to be frank, scar our collective moral conscience. European civilization has, I've always believed, an animal well, has animal welfare at its, at its heart, and Europeans ultimately want to see the end of such scenes. Fortunately, we have a new commission, um, which is just over a year old, the, the, the von der Leyen Commission, and they have signaled their willingness to look at this issue afresh and have made commitments which, at least to our ears, are very encouraging. Now, just before we introduce or I hand over to my colleague and our CEO to introduce a very important speaker, I'll just run through some very brief housekeeping notes um, for everyone. So first of all, my apologies, I feel I should say as a, as a, as a, as a Brit that this event will be held entirely in, in English, um, but uh, that's the way things work these days, unfortunately. Uh, also, please add any questions that you have um, during the event uh, using the, the question and answer function. Um, they will be addressed, but we will do so at the end of the session. Um, you also all have access to the chat box, um, but please avoid uh, adding questions into that. Um, use the Q&A function instead, as otherwise we might miss your question. Uh, and finally, um, again, just to remind everyone, this is being recorded, but only the introductions and the um, presentations. We won't be recording anything in the Q and A session. Um, so for now, it's my great pleasure to hand over to my, my colleague and indeed our, my chief executive, Reinika Hamaliers. Reinika, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Joe. And also on my behalf, thank you so much for joining today's important event on the future of the transport regulation. And it is my great pleasure to announce our next speaker, uh, Commissioner for Agriculture, Janusz Wojciechowski. And before becoming a commissioner, 
uh, Mr. Wojciechowski has been very active on improving the welfare of animals during transport. And during his time as member of the European Parliament, he was the rapporteur of the European Parliament report on the protection of animals during transport in 2012. And here we are today discussing the future of the transport regulation. But also as president of the Animal Welfare Intergroup, Mr. Wojciechowski always endeavored to raise this topic on the political agenda. Once again, Commissioner Wojciechowski, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your views on the future of this very important regulation. Mr. Wojciechowski, the floor is yours. Could you please unmute yourself? Yes, very good. Yes, very good. Thank you very much, Reineke, for 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 introduction. Thank you for for invitation, dear, dear, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this uh, it's my pleasure for me to open this event on the transport of leaf animals, and I want to thank uh, Eurogroup for animals for the invitation and first of all for organizing of this this event thank you for remaining of my previous activity in the uh, uh, animal welfare issues yes animal welfare is very close to my heart uh, in the uh, uh, you said about the, my uh, activity in the par european parliament but also also in the european court of auditors i was res responsible for the uh, audit uh, on animal welfare issues and including the transport and the improvement the situation in transport of animals was one of the conclusions and recommendations uh, from this, this this report the protection of animals during transport remains to be a high priority for the commission and for me personally uh, the current legal framework uh, council regulation the 2005 uh, has brought considerable improvements uh, for the animal uh, for the uh, welfare of animals for instance as regard to the quality of uh, the means uh, of transport used official data from member states and commission audit reports indicate a, a high level of compliance with these rules when vehicles are in eu eu territory furthermore the recent regulation on official controls in the food chain allow improving the efficiency of the controls made by member state authorities and their uh, coordination. However, the Commission remains uh, conscious and continuous improvements are necessary as regards the um, informants of the legislation. In particular, this concerns the transport on long journeys and in particular the export to non-EU countries. Uh, in this context, the Commission uh, also has an important role to play. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, last December I had the pleasure to be invited to a session of the ANIT committee and I uh, would also in this occasion to ensure you that we do take this task very seriously. Uh, as the, uh, the Commissioner for Agriculture, I am in charge for the animal welfare issues that fall under the common agricultural policy. The CAP can provide tools to support local production. This is very important, support for, for local production, having production close to processing plants that are nearby local markets would actually shorten the road from farm to fork, uh, which sometimes can be extremely long such as uh, from one side uh, of Europe to the other. The, for, for, for me, the, the strategy from farm to fork this is first of all to reduce distance, to reduce this road from, from, from farm to fork. And this is big chance to, to improve the situation on animal welfare in transport, reducing the, 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 the transport. Farms are available for this purpose and by introducing these types of programs, the need of transport um, uh, leaf animals can be reduced. Uh, if producers and uh, food processors are motivated to produce locally based on short supply chains, then the transport of animals over long distance will no longer be viable and profitable. We need much more animal welfare and uh, 
I can assure you this is my priority for the reform of the CAP. It was the, the reason that also we included the question of animal uh, animal welfare, taking into account also the transport uh, as an eco scheme proposed for the for the uh, as as a one of the uh, 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 as an important part of the direct payment, the first pillar of the common agricultural policy. Uh, in the uh, framework uh, of the farm to fork strategy, the Commission will revise the uh, EU animal welfare legislation, including on animal transport, by 2023. 20, uh, uh, the content and scope of this revision will be defined on the basis of a fitness check of the legislation, which has been launched in May 2020. Uh, the purpose of the evaluation is to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of the current legislation and the extent to which it still fits with today's needs, meets uh, the objectives of farm to fork strategy and serves the purpose of uh, animal welfare. Therefore, I welcome Eurogroup for Animals White Paper on the revision of uh, the transport regulation, which provides uh, species-specific solutions to current problems and gaps. Uh, and I look forward to reading the paper myself. Uh, dear all, I want to conclude my speech today by reminding that the Commission will therefore follow your work with great interest. And in the meantime, let me ensure you that the informants of current rules will remain high on the Commission's agenda. Thank you for your attention and I wish you constructive and fru fruitful exchange of views. Thank you very much. Commissioner, many, Commissioner, thank you indeed for uh, those words. As I said, we are indeed, of course, very uh, grateful um, to the von der Leyen Commission and to yourself for process that you're going through and your willingness to, to look at this regulation afresh. Uh, we also understand that, that we have to go through the, the process of the fitness check first and the, the, that certain procedures um, have to be followed. It was also heartening just to hear your reference to shortening supply chains and to fundamentally shifting the way that we look at uh, the system that ultimately underpins the, the, the current level of, of, of life transport. Um, one thing I, I, I will say is, as, a, as a, someone who came into this, what, about 10 years ago into the animal welfare movement was that I found it somewhat incredible that in modern day Europe, we can do so much, whether it be in science or technology and even putting, I don't know, probes on asteroids and all these, these incredible technological developments yet we somehow can't seem to send meat simply in uh, freezers. And I think that this is something that quite honestly baffles and um, confounds most European citizens. And that's something hopefully that we can get to um, over the next few years. Of course, the, the purpose of this event is really for Eurogroup for Animals to show what uh, we think of, uh, could be included in terms of this upcoming legislative revision. Um, we will be able to also, you, you will all of you be able to read the, uh, the report, um, our, our white paper, um, which will be shared through the chat pane, and I can only encourage you to download it. But first of all, we have um, created a short introduction, a video, um, which will give an overview to what we would like to see and what is in our white paper. Uh, and uh, we will start off with showing that now, and then we will move on to the presentations. So, um, Cecilia, please, if I can ask you to, to kick the video off.
Thank you for that. And hopefully that gives everyone a very brief overview of not just some of the aspects that we want to see improved, but also actually reminds us all of the sheer breadth that the transport regulation covers. Of course, this isn't simply about uh, conventionally farm terrestrial animals. We're, all, we're, we're touching here everything from dogs and cats through to equines and, and fish. Um, and in fact, just to give us a slightly broader overview of that now, we are uh, going to run through a series of very short presentations from some of my other colleagues um, who will guide us through each kind of species group in terms of what we at least would like to see. And just a, a reminder again, um, that the, the, the white paper um, from us is now available for you to look at in the chat box. So first of all, um, I'm delighted to hand over um, for our uh, terrestrial farmed animals and um, it's my dear colleague Francesca Porter who will run you through uh, this. So Francesca, over to you. So good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you again for having joined uh, this event. It would be a pleasure for me to guide you through uh, the white paper that your group of animals prepared in view of the revision of the of the transport regulation. So first of all, the starting point of this white paper was the uh, European Commission declared aim of revising this regulation uh, to align it with the latest scientific knowledge to ensure higher animal welfare to uh, broaden the scope of the regulation per se, and also to make the legislation easy to be enforced. Uh, and we know that a vast range of species are transported for a commercial reason. And in principle, the transport regulation should apply to the commercial transport of uh, live vertebrate animals. But in reality, the majority of its provision are um, focusing on the transport of certain species of terrestrial farm animals. So we see that the provision for equine, cats and dog and fish are less developed and completely absent are provision to ensure the welfare of those animals that are transported for scientific reason. So what we did with this paper was to consider all these animals and for each of these animal group, we have a dedicated section where we highlight the main legislative shortcomings and gaps. And we also propose um, a science-based suggestion to make sure that all these animals will receive the protection they deserve as a, a sentient being. Just to go a bit more in detail, uh, for equine, uh, we, uh, we opted for a, a targeted approach just to effectively reply to the uh, EFSA conclusion that those animals have a particular needs that are quite different from the other farm animal species that are transported. We also took stock of uh, um, all the, uh, the recommendation of the EU Animal Welfare Platform with regard to the transport of pets. And so we put forward specific provision for the transport of cats and dogs. And also we uh, address the lack of uh, specific provision for the transport of laboratory animals. And we propose both general and species specific provision for the welfare of these animals. With regard to the rest of farm animal and fish, we propose a science-based provision, which aimed at, of course, ensuring a better animal welfare, but also aim at aligning the, uh, the, the transport regulation, the, the revised transport regulation with the farm to fork strategy, which aim at building up a more sustainable food chain. Now, um, with regard to uh, the uh, terrestrial farm uh, animal section, uh, Andrea, please, if you can share the, uh, the slide. Our proposal follows the expert recommendation that, uh, um, um, that live transport should be avoided whenever possible. And when this is not avoidable, then the journey should be kept as short as possible. And indeed, already in uh, 2002, the Scientific Committee on Animal Health and Welfare um, outlined that there is a link between animal welfare and the length of the journey. But regardless of that, the transport regulation, which entered into force years later, still allowed for a long and very long distance journey. So we believe that the uh, transport time is something that must be addressed. Eurogroup did that in its white paper. And of course, following EFSA conclusion from 2004 that animals react very differently to the stress and the challenges posed by transport on the basis of the species they belong to, but also their age. We propose a species and category specific maximum journey time with a maximum travel time of eight hours for adult bovine, ovine and swine and four hours for poultry and rabbits. 
We also believe that there are specific animal categories that must be protected. So we propose a, a maximum journey time of four hours for the animals at the end of the production cycle, regardless of the transport condition and the species they belong to. And we also believe that pregnant animals that are over 40% of the pregnancy stage should not be transported as well as unweaned animals. We are as well conscious that such a shift from a system in which we are used to transport animals for days and weeks uh, to a system in which we will have just a fewer live transport over short distance requires some time. So in our proposal, we also put forward a derogation uh, for a transitional period of 12, uh, sorry, 18 months from the entry into force of the, of the revised text to allow for a bit longer distance journey of 12 hours for adult animals of course, preview the fulfillment of specific category. This transitionary period in our view could also apply to the export of live animals, but only uh, with a, within a limit of eight and four hours, as said before, and only for uh, 18 months. After this period, we believe that the European Union should stop any live export, regardless of the purpose of the export, the species to be transported and the condition. Once that we have set the scene of this short distance transport, uh, we are conscious that we also need to have species specific provision for such a kind of transport. So at first, uh, what we propose in our white paper is to have a clear set of definitions. So we provided species specific definition for unwind animal, for um, uh, uh, injured animal, distressed animal, a definition for journey time. So a clear set of definition that can um, prevent the transport of unfit animals, but also make the regulation easier to be implemented. So to provide really member state and operator with key provision to be applied. Other than the, the definition, what we suggest are uh, species specific space allowances for mammals, but also for poultry and, and, uh, and uh, rabbits. We know that for rabbits, there is a huge problem and EFSA uh, last year released an opinion on that. And clearly they said that the systematic use of poultry cage for the transport of rabbits is uh, uh, responsible for major welfare problems. So we believe that the next um, transport regulation should provide key uh, provision on the design, the construction and the positioning of species specific condition, as a species specific uh, crate. Another huge problem are the temperature. So what we propose is to have live transport only with external temperature between plus five, plus 25, with some differentiation for certain animal category like lactating cows, spent hens, and rabbits. And another issue that um, we think it must be addressed is the use of livestock vessel. We have seen that livestock vexel, the transport BSC is quite problematic because of the um, use of very old uh, uh, vessel. So we think that a way to um, overcome this problem, it could be to have a EU authority approving the vessel on the basis of uh, a strict uh, uh, list of uh, technical requirements and also uh, preview the approval of an expert of team that should be made of at least one veterinarian, one marine technician and one marine uh, surveyor. So um, I hope that I manage in just a short time to provide you with a kind of overview of what we propose for, uh, for farm animals. Um, just to conclude, um, we are conscious that many issues still need to be investigated and EFSA is preparing an opinion on live transport. So we hope also that we will have key provision coming from that opinion. But uh, the scientific research on welfare during transport is quite developed. And what we try to do with this, uh, uh, with this paper was to take everything that is out there and to find a place to communicate to the co-legislator, to the stakeholder, to the NGO, how the future uh, how the future transport regulation should look like. So thank you so much, and I look forward to reply to your question. Thank you, um, Francesca. And as you all begin to digest the uh, contents of this paper, um, we should also bear in mind that um, a large part of this work has fallen on Francesca's shoulders. So um, a huge debt of gratitude, I think, from several of us um, to her for, for all of this. Uh, now we will move from 
animals that are farmed on land to animals in the sea and that are farmed in water um, and looking at the transport of fish. So I would like to introduce my colleague and friend Douglas Bailey, who is our fish welfare programme leader. Doug, over to you. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. Uh, and let me start by saying a few words about what I'm uh, addressing, what I mean when I'm talking about live fish transport. Uh, and I, we are mostly talking about aquaculture and farmed fish. Uh, there is an element of the aquarium trade, uh, sport fishing and other aquatic invertebrates, but they're a much uh, smaller part of the picture. And I'm really focusing on farmed fish here. In some sectors, uh, we're talking about market-sized fish to a slaughter facility. And uh, in all cases, we're talking about the transport of juvenile fish from specialist hatcheries to the grow out farms. And when I say juveniles, I'm talking about fish that are typically uh, six months to a year old. And we don't have official numbers of how many uh, fish we're talking about, uh, but the best estimate is that this is somewhere between one and two billion uh, live fish transported in Europe every year. Uh, and cross-continental journeys up to 36 hours are a common part uh, of this picture. So let me say a few words about the existing regulation 1-2005. Uh, fish are fully within the, the vertebrates scope of the regulation and that brought some important uh, generic requirements and protections to fish, for example, uh, around documentation of journeys. Uh, but it's very clear in the regulation that fish were really quite far from people's minds as uh, the text was drafted and finalised. Uh, we can see uh, in there are inspection protocols that can even be detrimental to the welfare of fish. There are requirements to provide ventilation uh, when fish are standing. Um, there's a requirement to provide fish with anti-slip flooring surface. Um, of course, these things are, they're not appropriate and, and, and they're completely uh, not implementable. Um, in commission reports in recent years, we, we've seen this acknowledged and, and they've recognised um, the implementation problems and resulting market distortions that, that that's caused in aquaculture. And also in the commission study, we've seen that uh, 1 slash 2005 is uh, collectively a lower standard than the fish transport chapter of the uh, OIE Aquatic Animal Health Code at the moment. Um, so let me come on to say something about the recommendations that we make and what we hope to see in a new regulation. And there are three aspects that are particularly important to the welfare of fish during transport. Um, and none of these three aspects are, are covered in the current regulation. Uh, firstly, is monitoring and maintaining water quality during the entire journey. And that is especially about providing supplemental oxygen and it's about having uh, monitoring equipment that is constantly monitoring the, the key water quality parameters. Uh, secondly is the question of uh, starving fish before transport. Uh, part of maintaining water quality during the journey is that the fish uh, must not be excreting metabolic wastes into the water during the journey. Therefore, there's a starvation period before loading, and this must be regulated uh, to minimise that starvation period um, only as long as it takes to clear the gut and not longer. And the third point, uh, acclimatising the fish to the water conditions that they're going to be unloaded into uh, before they unlo are unloaded. This is reducing acute stress uh, and also the associated time to resume feeding. There's a lot more but beyond these three key points. Um, I will highlight the, the importance of recording the causes of mortality uh, during transport, keeping those physical inspections to a minimum um, and only carrying them out if monitoring equipment has indicated a problem and uh, designing equipment and procedures to minimise the handling and to make it gentle. Uh, a lot more is common with terrestrial animals, um, principles of training personnel, assessing the animals prior to loading. There's a lot more detail in our report. Uh, please click on it and have a look. 
I'm uh, looking forward to some questions from you, hopefully. And with that, I'm handing back over to Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'm, I'm sure indeed you'll get several questions on this. I have already seen one or two pop up whilst you were speaking. Um, now we move on to a very particular uh, group of animals that are very possibly um, the most transported in Europe overall. Uh, and that's, uh, those are equines. Um, we're very fortunate as well at Eurogroup for Animals to have the expertise and, and brilliance of, of World Horse Welfare, um, one of the, the world's top equine organisations as one of our members. And um, it's with great pleasure that I hand over to World Horse Welfare's Director of Communications and Public Affairs, Jessica Stark, who will take you through the provisions for horses, donkeys and other equines. Thank you very much, Joe, and um, thank you so much for inviting us to speak here today. We enjoyed working on the report um, and we truly welcome this opportunity we have to, to much better protect uh, equines during transport in Europe. Um, as was said at the beginning by Francesca, um, uh, horses have very specific needs or all equines have very specific needs and um, that they are different in many ways to other large transported livestock. And so it's vital that we have uh, regulations that suit those needs particularly, um, rather than as we see often, they can be treated more like cows. Uh, there are many factors that impact uh, equine welfare during transport. This infographic highlights uh, just a few um, and where we think we need uh, stronger solutions to protect their welfare. And these are based on, on evidence as thankfully there is uh, a fair amount, uh, not enough ever, but a um, fair amount of evidence to substantiate what we're recommending here. Um, first off, um, maximum journey times. Uh, we believe there should be a maximum journey time for the transport of horses. Um, we find under the current 1-2005 regulation, horses can be and are transported often for days on end. Um, and even with rest periods, this is uh, very detrimental to their welfare. And we believe they should have adequate and fixed rest times. Horses can become extremely exhausted on these journeys. And oftentimes the, uh, the uh, suggested rest times are not complied with. We also believe that where there are rest stops, there needs to be suitable high standard provision uh, that is suitable for them staffed by people who are competent in addressing and fulfilling the needs of equines. Uh, we need a, a network of control posts that can truly provide them uh, with rest. And uh, the competence of uh, the staff, uh, try as they might, we need much better training and better understanding of their needs. We also need um, horses to, uh, for there to be, you know, increasing the total rest time and also that cleanliness on vehicles. Equines, uh, horses are very susceptible to respiratory uh, disease on long journeys for a number of reasons. And the more that those vehicles can be clean and hygienic, that uh, will help to protect not only their welfare, but their health. And we also, horses as flight animals can be quite nervous of new situations, and this can uh, highly increase their stress level. So there is a need to uh, better familiarize uh, equines uh, with vehicles, with loading and with unloading. Those are the most uh, stressful and risky points in a journey for equines. Uh, so that needs to be uh, accounted, considered uh, when protecting their welfare during transport. And also, again, it comes down to training. There are so many factors uh, around transport that can impact welfare. And one of the most significant uh, is, is the human elephant, uh, human elephant it's element. It's the way that um, they are handled. It is the way they are um, monitored. It's the provision of food and water. It's what people can do to provide for them uh, that we find really lacking currently. And that needs to be much more robust. We also need uh, harmonized standards uh, for vehicles. 
uh, that transport equines on long journeys. Uh, there needs to be um, a number of um, provisions, including appropriate ventilation, uh, watering systems that work where there are watering systems there, and temperature on the vehicle. It needs to be within a comfortable range. It needs to be controlled. Uh, and also, finally, with the behavior of the animals is sort of the best indicator and most immediate indicator of whether or not their welfare is being protected. So on vehicles, we believe there should be uh, video uh, so that the driver, the transporter can see how the animals are reacting to their environment. Again, these are um, just a few of the many factors that can impact um, horses and transport. Um, and we uh, strongly support um, and hope you will too any uh, efforts along these lines to improve their welfare. Thank you. Super stuff. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica. And um, um, horses and donkeys and, and, and the like are often kept as forms of companion animals. And we actually move now in a way from one form to the more common form um, with dogs and cats who are currently covered uh, in the most meager fashion possible by the current law. Um, the regulation uh, currently stipulates almost nothing for them, but uh, there needs to be a lot done to, to improve the current situation. And to guide you through that, I um, hand over to my colleague Ivona Mertin, who is our companion animal programme leader. Ivona, over to you. Yes, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Yes, you might be wondering what these cats and dogs are actually doing here and doing in this report. And as Joe rightfully pointed out, uh, first thing why we focus on that topic is that they, they're actually virtually two, two, literally two, two references to cats and dogs in the regulation one, so 2005, nothing else, just two. One about the young age, another one about watering and feeding, both very generic, not very species specific. And as a result of that, we end up with uh, having very unclear rules on how cats and dogs can be transported, what is the legal way of transporting cats and dogs. And uh, that's why we focus on that particular topic. Another reason is that there's a general uh, assumption that actually cats and dogs are not often transported across Europe or on long distances. Uh, I'm pretty sure that many of you think, uh, think uh, the same or have the same thoughts. Uh, and actually, if you look at the page 12 of our report, you're going to see uh, some statistics, uh, a bit uh, old statistics actually, but uh, these are the only, uh, uh, reported statistics that we have. And according to these statistics, only 23,000 of cats and dogs are transported annually, according to traces. And then you might think, yes, it's only, only or already 23,000. And uh, actually, uh, these, uh, these uh, animals are transported cross border, mostly from Eastern Europe, from Southern Europe, from countries like Hungary, Slovakia, Spain, to other countries in Europe, such as France, Germany, and uh, just recently the UK. And uh, putting this in perspective, actually with numbers that are being reported by other sources, there's a huge discrepancy to what officially is transported and, and what is actually happening. So just to quote you a few numbers, you can find uh, in our report, there are about 50,000 uh, dogs that are entering UK on an annual basis. There's only 4% of these animals uh, that has traces entering Italy. Uh, there are about 5,000 dogs that leave Romania monthly. And there are about 50,000 dogs entering illegally France on an annual basis. We can see that there's clearly a huge movement of cats and dogs that directly feeds into legal pet trade. If you want to see how that actually looks like when there are no specific rules, please check pages 40 and 43 of our report. There you will find photos of just examples of how animals are actually being transported right now. And that's why we think that really something has to change in that regard. Uh, and uh, there is incentive among the member states 
And this incentive we could already see in the EU platform on animal welfare recommendations uh, for uh, commercial movement of cats and dogs. So I do advise you also to consult these documents because this document feeds directly onto our white paper uh, because we find it very good in terms of recommendations for containers, watering, feeding, positioning of containers, as well as fitness of animals for transport. So to conclude, uh, we believe that only setting up species specific rules accompanied by effective enforcement will provide a basis for transport of cats and dogs that is both legal and animal welfare conscious. So should you have any questions at any point, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you, Joe. Back to you. Thank you, Ivona. And um, yes, indeed, it, that's the crucial distinction of this regulation. It's not animals who are in any way farmed necessarily, it's animals who are moved commercially. And this brings us to uh, the final presentation for now, um, which uh, touches on animals um, in basically moved for scientific purposes from laboratory to laboratory. Um, and with, that's also, of course, a, a key component in terms of the uh, of commercial movements within Europe. So uh, it's with great pleasure that I hand over to our dear colleague, Penny Hawkins, who is the head of animals in science department at the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in the UK, the RSPCA. Uh, Penny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so I'll begin with the most recently available statistics on lab animal use within the EU from 2017. So 9.4 million animals were used for the first time for scientific purposes, mostly mice, rats, fish and birds, and a further 13.9 million laboratory animals were bred in the EU. There is little published information on the transport of these animals. We know that 98% of the animals used, apart from non-human primates, were born in the EU, and just over 87% of primates used were born outside the EU, mainly in Africa and Asia. But there are no data on the numbers transported within member states and no details of the nature or duration of their journeys. So, of course, Eurogroup is opposed to the use of animals in science, which causes pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm. And the primary goal is to end animal use by replacing them with humane alternatives. And as long as animal use continues, Eurogroup promotes measures that will help in suffering and improve welfare. So therefore, as a key principle, Eurogroup believes that the transport of laboratory animals should be avoided. Now, of course, journeys can be stressful for any animal, but there are some special issues for animals in science. For example, lab animals are traveling between highly controlled environments as prescribed by Directive 201063 EU, which sets out housing conditions and the physical environment in the laboratory. So during transport, these animals will be in a highly unfamiliar and unpredictable environment, which will lead to physiological and behavioral stress responses. And some lab animals may have special needs. For example, they may be obese, diabetic, hairless, or specific pathogen free, maybe immunocompromised, or they may have had surgery. So um, the ability to monitor lab animals in transit may also be reduced, for example, if they're specific pathogen free and containers can't be opened. Now, the experiences of lab animals in transit are important, not only for each individual animal at the time, but also because transport is recognized as one of the lifetime harms to lab animals, alongside stressful events like marking for identification, restraint, husbandry procedures, and of course the scientific procedures themselves. According to our current understanding of cumulative severity, a distressing journey could actually affect the animal's subsequent experience of scientific procedures, making it essential to minimize transport stress. So, if there is no alternative to transporting lab animals, then clear and species specific provisions, including litter and container enrichment, temperature ranges, feeding and watering requirements, grouping and density provisions for laboratory animals shall be set by law. Adequate monitoring and care are especially important. So an attendant trained to handle, transport and take care of lab animals shall be present during the entire journey except where the driver or the transporter can perform these functions. 
and the attendant responsible for welfare shall have a valid certificate of competence for animal handling, transport and care, so they understand the special needs of these animals. And this training shall include species specific husbandry, recognising when an animal is ill or unfit for transport, recognising and alleviating stress and administering veterinary drugs and euthanasia. Adequate and tailored record keeping is essential through lab animals' lives, including in transit. So journey logs should be adapted to report animal welfare aspects during the journey, transport temperatures, watering and feeding times. And geolocation systems shall also be developed to track the animal's location, log journey duration and detect and log any non-compliance with transport schedules. Finally, announced and unannounced controls should be carried out by member states to assess compliance and annual inspection reports by member states shall include a detailed section on laboratory animals. All of this will help to better understand the experience of laboratory animals during transit so that harms can be minimised, non-compliances can be identified and dealt with and animals can be given adequate recovery time on arrival and this will benefit both animal welfare and science for as long as animal experiments continue. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, I realise at this stage now everyone has given quite a lot of information, although this is of course only an overview. Um, and it's probably quite a lot for some of you to take in who I can also see questions popping up in the, in the, in the Q and A um, uh, box. So um, I think what we might do now, given that we're pretty much on time, it would be just to have a three minute comfort break for everyone. Um, so time to, to, to go away from your computers, should you so wish, just to also allow you to have to, the time to prepare your questions um, if you have any that you want to put down. Please don't forget to drop them in the question and answer box and we will see you again precisely in what time is it now it's one minute to two so i will start again at i'll say yeah three minutes past um so if you can all be back by then thanks very much indeed
Okie dokie, welcome back everybody. Um, first of all, I just want to flag the message from my colleague Agnesi in the chat box, who uh, says if anyone wants to know any more about any events that we're doing or our work, you can subscribe to the magazine via the chat box. So it's just to flag that. Um, and then I will turn to the question